I thought I'd start with really not telling you too much more about GP Forward View because you've heard all about that, but just sort of share with you some of the processes that we have to go through. Um, Thinking back before general practice forward view came into being, what the college was clearly aware of was a lot of stress, a lot of distress amongst the membership, amongst yourselves about workloads. No question at all about the pleasure or pride that uh, GPs still have in the work, but a growing question about can we do this, about the capacity to do this, the capacity to do it well. That did not automatically turn into a campaign. We were having to think through what have we got here, how serious is this, how big is it, and actually commission some serious research to make a case. The power of that research not only helped us shape our thinking and, and Maureen's key call to, to turn it into a campaign, but also really had significant impact. I was very surprised talking to a, an extremely senior <coughs> member of the NHS management site, who I would have expected know this, that at first meeting said, your campaign message, we're not arguing with this, but we didn't know it. Now, I think that's really striking that this, the college has actually had to put the case together for the general practice forward view. And we did that through some really good research. And we are continuing to research. We are researching the fact that in the last seven years, there's been a 16% increase in GP workloads. That's just in terms of numbers of consultations. And in the last three years, we're noticing actually despite what we're hearing, the optimistic message, measure, message is an actual decrease in the number of GPs currently working. These are very serious issues. We run the campaign. We made it an effective campaign. I think we landed some really key messages, but we've continued to have to think about the messaging. I hope we've got that right. We had a long, hard think about whether crisis was the right word to use. We called that. You, you remember we were discussing that a year or two ago. But we also are now having to be very careful. We do not want to remain in crisis mode. And it's clear that what we're hearing now from the forward view, and indeed in terms of the, the messages that the college have been de developing, is that we need to be looking forward. We need to be introducing new uh, notes of optimism and hope here. So it's a very, very sensitive issue. We rely hugely on the deliberations of our college council. But more than that, we really rely on the, the mailbox, the inbox, the tweets, the comments that we get as to whether we're getting this right. Of course, Forward View was a major result, and it was delightful to see that as it was launched, it was launched uh, with an acknowledgement that it was in partnership with the Royal College of GPs. Uh, it wasn't difficult for us to take a view about whether we would support that. We know that some people thought it should have gone further. We know that some people are still disappointed that it's moving too slowly. However, we took a view very quickly, and I think it was absolutely the right one, that we would support it, we would welcome it, and we could co collaborate with it. But that does not mean that we're resting on our laurels. Part of our positioning has been to be both partner and critic to this exercise. And believe me, it's quite a difficult one, uh, it's quite a difficult balance to get right. And I'm congratulating Maureen and the team in, in the way that we've been handling that. Clear challenges, clear welcomes of the announcements, clear, of course, support for where it's heading, but clear critic. We have several representatives on the GP Forward View Oversight Board. We have uh, campaigned successfully to create a subgroup to monitor the investment that's going into the Forward View to make sure that this really does reach into practice where it's needed. We meet with NHS England every two weeks just to discuss concerns and share experiences and thoughts and so forth. And we'll now be working with Ipsos Mori to ensure that we actually are able to track where the investment is going and whether it is actually reaching its intended targets. We needed to be agile in a response to this. Having taken a view that we, we liked it, uh, we moved quickly to create Ambassador's team. Uh, I want to stress here, that was a decision that was supported by some changes in management. We've introduced also a change in governance so that we are regularly tracking this work. The Ambassadors work for the college. They do not work for anyone else. They do not work for the NHS. They are our members. We interviewed them. We are making closer links as we speak with the local faculties in England, uh, and the Ambassadors have proved already a huge value to us. We have had to recognize, however, and you've heard the points already made, that the progress, indeed the priorities that the new STPs have been taking uh, have not been quite what we would have hoped. We recognize the reality, of course, that there are some very major challenges elsewhere in the health system and that general practice isn't the only game in town. But we are really, really concerned at the lack of engagement, serious engagement with our ambassadors. We're funding them. 
We are briefing them to be the voice of general practice and the voice of the college. Uh, we meet with them, we brief with them, and we also debrief with them. And they are telling us that in many cases, what you've already heard is that general practice is struggling to get onto the agenda there. And that is a serious problem. And that is one that we are continuing to check out locally. And of course, we're continuing to review our position nationally with regards to our enthusiasm and how warm an embrace we continue to have uh, with the overall project. However, the ambassadors, I think, where it's working are seen as being a key voice for provider GPs. They are seen as a significant representation of a stakeholder group. They are using their time to meet with other people political contacts, local MPs, and so forth. It's really a good scheme, this, and I've been delighted by the enthusiasm and the, uh, the determination that our ambassadors have shown. They are around here, of course, at college. Uh, they're having an informal meeting at the uh, college stand in the exhibitions hall tomorrow morning at 10. Unfortunately, that's during one of the plenaries, but do meet them if you want to. And uh, they'll also be around at the faculty fringe tomorrow evening at 5.30. So we've had our concerns there, um, and we are, as you know, uh, continuing to call for greater emphasis on general practice and all the measures that Arvind was discussing uh, already. That's England. Uh, outside England, we've got to recognize that there is further work to be done. Uh, Maureen mentioned this, and the college is not letting up in its determination to secure. It will be different but equivalent gains for general practice outside England. Uh, I think the England model has lots to go for it, but we are recognizing, of course, as health systems diverge, the college has to get more savvy about the way we handle a four nations agenda. And I want to pay tribute. You saw their faces uh, on the opening screen if you were in the room, but our devolved country chairs, Dr. Miles Mack in Scotland, Rebecca Payne, Wales, Dr. John O'Kelly in Northern Ireland, soon to be uh, succeeded by Dr. Grania Doran. The, these devolved country chairs have been doing a huge amount of work outside of England. Uh, they have become the face, recognized face of general practice. They've been leading calls for more investment. They have been routinely, in fact, hugely in the media on some occasions. And it's been great to watch. And we are looking carefully at how we can resource that work uh, as we go into planning for next year. Each of the three nations, as similar to England, yeah, we are, we are. Uh, in each of the three nations, uh, as well as England, we are seeing now general practice really is a key political issue. Uh, our leaders across the UK have engaged with the governing parties, key health ministers, key decision makers, and opposition parties. In Scotland, and I'm, I'm hoping these all still stand, I know the situation changes, but in Scotland, we've convinced the government to increase investment in primary care by 90 million pounds, and virtually all the opposition parties are now calling on ministers to give general practice at least 10%, ideally 11% of the NHS budget. In Wales, we've convinced ministers to increase investment in primary care by one to 123 million pounds, and the government is launching a GP recruitment campaign to entice those who've left to come back home, come back from overseas and practice as family doctors. And in Northern Ireland, we've convinced the government to increase investment in general practice by 19 million and invest in developing GPs as NHS leaders. We're hoping that these will all turn into absolute firm pledges and that we'll be able to get our hearts, minds, and energies around implementing those plans as we have in England. So we've been doing a lot of work on campaigning, representing your needs for an improved working life and improved job satisfaction and improved patient outcomes. We are in the business of developing stronger general practice for better patient care. But we're also needing to look forward. And we have, of course, identified the uh, recruitment problem. We are doing a lot of work uh, on, on the GP challenge, the recruitment challenge. We have a new student engagement strategy to promote general practice. Um, across all the medical schools in the UK. A few years ago, there were just a handful of these. There are now 30. That means we have a GP society in virtually all of them. We've still got a little gap to close, and it's an exciting development. They're run by students who are passionate about general practice, who are fired up about the idea that being an expert medical general, generalist is the place to be. And they want to show other students how intellectually challenging how varied a life as GP, diverse, and indeed, how fun it can be. We're also recognizing, of course, that GP work is moving towards uh, uh, operating at scale. Of course it is, because the demand is growing and the complexity of the work is growing. Uh, we think that the work on scale is really an important area for the college to be. 
and we have uh, invested now in a new uh, general practice at scale program in partnership with the Nuffield Trust. And through this program, we're developing an online learning, learning network to assist those interested in working in this way, uh, understand and learn lessons from each other, uh, to share good experiences and indeed pitfalls to avoid, and making sure that work. We think we have around 50 primary care organizations already in this network. We think that's about a fifth of all of them. And if there are representatives of any other groups that wish to be involved in that, please do make contact with us. A quick word about quality. It's been mentioned this morning. It's been a major part of the college's work throughout its history. Um, we had, for many years, the general the quality practice award scheme, and which recognized those practices that were operating to the very highest quality uh, standards. That was a focus on practice. And following a review, uh, we want to help all 51,000 plus of our members to engage with the quality agenda and support practices achieving continuous improvement. So I'm pleased to announce that in the spring, we will be launching a major new online tool called Quality Improvement Ready. This will be free to all members. It will consist of an online network containing a variety of quality improvement case studies, resources for quality improvement that can be used very easily, and e-learning modules. And it will continue, of course, to offer space for debate and argument. Uh, members will be able to, once they're on that, be able to self-accredit as QI ready. I've also been asked to make a quick plug on the quality uh, side of it, just to mention that we are also committed to reducing the burden of regulation and to com committed to promoting appraisal as a positive experience, far from everyone's, uh, I know. As part of this work, we've produced a guide which busts common myths about the revalidation process, and Dr. Dr. Susie Caesar, who is our medical director for revalidation, will be on the RCGP stand at 2.30 this afternoon, introducing the guide and answering any questions you've got. Another way in which we're working on quality is through our Struggling Practices program. It helps many of the practices have been put into special measures by CQC. We're currently supporting 41 practices in England through a trained cohort of 75 advisors. CPD, of course, is a core part of the college's offer. Uh, we run over uh, events for over 5,000 members at Euston Square every year. Very highly regarded online learning for all our members. We launched our Be the Best You events. Uh, we're already attended by over 500 members, and I've heard a lot of acclaim for that. And of course, this conference you've heard, you've heard mentioned already, a huge uh, learning program here. But it's not just from uh, our central offices in London. Each year, our devolved councils provide education support to hundreds of members on issues that are key and locally relevant. And critically, our faculties provide face-to-face -face education and support for up to 16,000 members a year. A quick word, if I may, for the faculties. Uh, absolutely crucial, and we recognize the huge amounts of volunteer work that go into the work of our faculties at a local level. We relaunched uh, the faculty initiative with this document last year, having consulted a lot on the key roles for our local faculties, and recognizing that this, this role really is about providing a local focus for you, uh, an opportunity to provide support more locally and more immediately, to engage with local stakeholders, to influence, to share our agenda, and of course to be helping with the promotion of the career to students. We've also used vibrant faculties to promote the bright ideas uh, concept across faculty networks. Uh, and today, I'm sorry, at this conference, uh, but starting from now, online, or if you want to visit the stall, you can vote. We really welcome a large vote for this. Uh, we've had 45 nominations uh, for the best ideas coming forward from faculties, um, uh, and I think the president has had to take a view, has reduced now to uh, five that you can vote for. Um, and we'd really welcome your views as to what you think is most usable and most helpful to you in your work before the award is made. Just while I'm on faculties, and a bit naughty of me, but I'd just like a quick divert to international. They are, it is a faculty in some organizations. It's not quite for us. You saw again on the opening video, and uh, it's very important that we don't forget this, uh, 1,300 plus international members in 28 countries, 1,500 plus overseas members in 83 countries around the world, nine internationally accredited sites, Brunei, Dubai, Egypt, Kosovo, I won't name them all. A really important initiative for us and over 40 projects and partnerships worldwide. We're having a long look at our international work uh, and uh, Maureen Baker will be doing some of that when she's got a little bit more time on her hands and helping us think through 
best. But I wanted to plug just two things. One which I was particularly pleased to see. We developed a, as a new and at the moment fairly small partnership with MSF, that brilliant charity uh, that so many of us support. We already have two volunteers in post, one in Swaziland and one in Jordan. And our longer standing commitment to placing a VSO volunteer in Sierra Leone, which we had to defer for tragic reasons that you'll understand, we have now made that. That's uh, been made possible by the fundraising appeal uh, 60 for 60 that we ran a few years ago. We will be looking to increase these volunteer opportunities, so do contact our international team if you wish to. Just a plug on membership. We are a membership organization. It's critical that we do our best for you as members. We are in the middle of developing a membership experience strategy, which we hope will help us rethink the way in which we engage with you and making sure that we offer you the very best experience. Our challenge is making sure that you are fully satisfied as how we represent you, how we support you, and how we engage with you. And to stay focused on your needs, every year we do a, a survey. Our last survey had 17% response rate, which was incredibly helpful. We'd like it more, of course, but thank you very much those took part. We really use that. We really listen. We really think it through. We have also supplemented that with an increasing number of focus groups to just try and understand a little bit the more of the messages. 56% of members say that they are part of the RCG community in one way or another, which is not bad but it's not great either, and it gives us some challenge. We are committed to meeting that challenge. There's no point running surveys and asking you for your advice if we don't act on it. One theme very clear was we could do more on communications, better communications. We hope that uh, this has been at least one response that you recognize. Uh, this is its fifth edition, and we're having really good uh, uh, feedback on this, and we've been delighted by the response that we've had. We are also moving ahead to develop our website. This is just a sample. We're going to try and make it more personal, more accessible. We would welcome your advice online from today as to how you think our search could be improved. On finances, I will just simply say we're in a strong place. We closed last year with an operating surplus of 1.9 million pounds. Now, on to GP, uh, Think GP. Building a stronger general practice for better case, patient care. And we need a workforce that's large enough. We need to retain people in the workforce. We need to persuade people to return. But the key thing, of course, is getting the message across to sixth formers, medical students, and foundation doctors. We want to debunk, debunk the myths that Maureen was talking about earlier. We want to say that it's great, and we have been delighted by the response so far. 3,000 copies circulated, really excellent feedback. I will say, we need a successful general practice for you to do your work with patients. The nation needs a strong general practice. The UK needs a strong general practice. We obviously rely on you. We need a strong membership to be effective. Please tell us when we're getting it wrong. We're really listening. Thank you all for what you do, and enjoy the next few days, please.